We went away from a PID controller and to a new state space controller. Here, the continuous algebraic Riccati equation. But it just goes into a common fold. Well, we're um, back in the studio. Um, we know it's been a while, like three months, but we've been busy. Uh, we have. Our unpaid interns have been busy. No, we've actually been really busy. Um, we've spent a lot of time in Simulink getting a rocket ready for its next holddown. Um, we also live streamed for 21 hours and raised almost $1,000 for charity, so that happened. You cannot find the video on our channel. YouTube doesn't archive videos or streams that are longer than 18 hours, so sorry about that. Um, maybe next time, if there's a next time. But in the three months we've been gone, if you've been looking for some sweet, sweet rocketry content, there are tons of other really awesome creators, and we've linked some of our personal favorites down below. You should totally check them out. So the first thing that we did is we changed our model from continuous time to discrete time. And this is how a flight computer actually runs. It runs in loops, and each loop takes a certain amount of time. Um, and, and so you can do that in Simulink. You can change it to a discrete time where we match that time to the loop time of our flight computer. And it gives us a better idea of what the games will really look like and makes it a little bit more intuitive when interfacing with the hardware. So last time on Inside DevLog, we did a noise characterization test. We took the gyro noise data from that test, threw it into Simulink, and that allowed us to um, assess how well the common filter was filtering that data, 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 data. Those of you who are the most astute of viewers may be thinking, hmm, how come your old rocket worked when all it had was a PID controller and no filtering and was even running on an MPU 6050? Oh, how we love you, MPU 6050. This is because the PID controller takes in one signal and that one signal is the angle of the rocket. The angle of the rocket gets integrated from our gyro data. Uh, integration inherently helps smooth out noisy signals. One of the downsides of it is it does compound errors. A PID controller takes an angle, and if this is already a smooth signal, then it's going to be able to respond smoothly and nice and happy. Don't need any filtering, really. Um, you could still add filtering, but it works totally fine without. This is also why we were able to take theta, or the angle of the rocket, out of our common filter or state estimation for our LQR controller, because it's already a smooth signal. Now this raises a couple questions. Do I need a common filter? And how do I implement one? Well, we plan to do a whole video about this separately where we go more in depth with all that. So one of the things that concerned us about the Simulink model is that we really didn't know if it was a good representation of the rocket in reality. There's always this gap between how the simulation responds and how reality responds because we can't simulate down to the individual particle. Um, and this is always gonna be there. There's always this gap between simulation and reality, unless we are living in the simulation. But that's a different point. That's why we decided to implement a Monte Carlo style of simulating, where we throw in a bunch of different variables and disturbances into the simulation, run that all at the same time, and then plot it all together. And this allows us to see trends between different disturbances and different variables. And if we can see that like 90% of our, our simulations converge, we can say, okay, our gains are working for these, this set of disturbances and variables. Control! After we felt like we'd run enough simulations to melt most of Luke's CPU, it was time to implement the common filter into our flight code. And that meant it was time for another big refactor. And after so many refactors, there's a few things that you learn. And one of the key things that we've learned and has been really useful for us is that because we've written almost all of our libraries from the quaternion orientation stuff to our LQR control code to our common filter vector stuff, it was all written by us. And it means that debugging is so much faster. TVC rockets will fail. That's a fact, it's a guarantee. They're gonna fail, I'm sorry. But when they do fail, you wanna be able to learn and bounce back as quickly as possible. And a really nice way that you can do this is by actually understanding what's going on in your own code. So writing your own libraries or functions is really, really useful because you can figure out exactly where it's breaking and why. And you actually have a good intuition as to why that's happening. Now. One of the libraries that we didn't want to write ourselves was a matrix math library. After searching through a lot of Git repos, we found this really good one by a guy called Tom Stewart 89 It's for Arduino. The link is in the description. And we implemented that, changed some of our code structure to fit with this new matrix multiplication and matrix math code. Feeling pretty good about ourselves and our shiny new code, we brushed the dust off of Insight, pinged our Discord to let him know we'd be doing a hold down test, and we did a hold down test. We just did it. Subscribe. 
So you can tell immediately into test one that something's wrong. Like something is not working the way it should be. And so we're at the launch site and we're like, oh, something, something was definitely wrong with that test. What is it? Um, and we made a few tweaks in the code just to ensure that everything was working correctly. And we were there and we can't, we can't meet up that often. So we were like, might as well just run another test. So we did it and same thing happened. Something, something was definitely wrong. It almost looked like one of the axes was inverted, which couldn't be the case because we always verify before any test or launch that all the mechanical systems are working the way they should be. So we're like, we're like what do, what we, do we do? Well, we, we went back to my house and we, we did a little bit of digging, a little bit of debugging. And what turned out to be the issue is that the Z axis uh, theta gain was flipped. So at small, like when we would test it by hand and we would just gimbal the rock to make sure it was working the correct direction, um, the theta dot gain would overpower the theta gain at small angles and it would look like it was working correctly. And so we were like, Everything, everything's all right. Everything's going to work correctly in the test. But when it came to the test and it gimbaled to a large angle of theta, the gimbal would flip to the complete other direction and just threw the test uh, out of control. I'm out of control. Having fixed the issue with the theta input into the controller, we then tested the rocket again, just by hand, and we could still tell that something was not right. Simulation looks very good. Reality, not looking too hot. The issue was unit conversions. And every engineer has had a professor tell them multiple, multiple times that you need to watch your unit conversions and you need to be consistent. I'm so sorry. A lot of you might think, why don't you just launch the rocket? You're just burning motors unnecessarily. And it's because it's pretty difficult, almost impossible to intuitively tell if a controller or system is responding exactly like you plan it to. You can do all the simulations you want, but if there's some gap that you haven't accounted for, it's gonna be impossible to tell, and there's no way of telling. And so that's why we do hold down tests. It helps us get data back from reality and adjust our simulations so that future simulations can start to reflect reality more closely. You might also wanna consider doing a hold down test if you're struggling to get a clean ascent. Um, there's tons of ways you can do it. You can do it like we do with the motor in there, or you can slap a brushless motor and a propeller on there and just test your gains like that. Um, it's a lot safer and you're gonna be able to do it without breaking your hardware. One last step that we wanted to do before doing another hold down was to verify that the hardware was responding the way the simulation thought it would be. And to do this, we ran a simulation in Simulink and then we took the observed theta dot data, put it into the flight computer as the input theta dot data, and then ran an ascent loop. And so this uh, in turn gave us server response that we could observe um, on the gimbal. And it just let us know that, okay, the hardware is doing what it should be doing according to the simulation. And that just helped us to verify that everything would be good for the next hold down test. And then we did another hold down test. Baby, we finally got a good <laughs> After five months of work, we finally did it. We got the rocket to do something that we'd already done before with a rocket. Now, to reiterate, this is really important for us. And even though basically all we did was emulate a PID controller using LQR, it sets the stage for us to do a lot more interesting things, a lot more advanced control and more complicated flights. You gotta walk before you can propulsively land. And this is us walking. It sets the stage, we can add new things into our state vector and start to control for things like altitude and control for our translational position and actually start implementing our cameras into the control loop. But when you see a TVC rocket fly, there's obviously some disturbances. I mean, why would a rocket pitch over if there's nothing there to make it pitch over? Now, maybe it's ghosts. <laughs> Now this same principle goes for simulations. Um, the only way to get useful data from a simulation is to add in disturbances to disturb the system and see it control. Now we did this in the form of noisy gyro data. This was one step into adding disturbances into the system. But there's other disturbances that are much more difficult to quantify, such as air resistance or motor 
uh, performance issues or motor misalignment. Things like that are very difficult to quantify. Our key mistake was tuning the vehicle around disturbances that were too large. These ended up giving us gains that were too large and in a hold down test, these large gains made the vehicle put itself in positions that it was unable to recover from. Basins of attraction. Basins of attraction. Basins of attraction. So we are ending this devlog in a much better place than we were last time. We are gearing up to do flights. It's important to remember that we're students. Like we're doing this for fun and this isn't our job. We make content when we have free time and when we can. It's the same reason why we're in a garage for filming. Like we don't have all of the resources that we would if this was our full-time job. So we can't do everything as perfectly as we would like because of some of these limitations. That doesn't mean that it's a perfect excuse to not have a good step-by-step -step, step -step procedure, but it's part of the reasons that sometimes like we're a little bit loose. As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, you should check out some of the other channels below. They make really great content. A lot of them are on our Discord server as well, and they're just really nice people who are also building really cool rockets. That being said, you should also subscribe to us. Only 2% of people who watch our videos are actually subscribed. Probably. I have no clue if that's true. But you should subscribe, hit the notification bell, follow us on Twitter at Aerospace Orion, on Instagram at Orion Aerospace, and also check out our website, which is down below. And yeah, that's it. Next time, Rocket might be flying. We're also going to make a common filter video too. Probably. Who knows? Rock Rockets out. In gamer mode.